Hello and welcome to lecture 21.1, where we're going to talk about Hamilton Jacobi equations. So this is a really cool application of Hamilton's formulas. We are going to come up with a canonical transformation such that our new Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian, vanishes identically. So if we start with the Hamiltonian H of Q, P, and T, we're going to come up with a canonical transformation such that the new Hamiltonian vanishes. Of course, Q, P, old and new uh, can be uh, vectors, so they can have multiple degrees of freedom. So if the new Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian vanishes, then uh, from here we can conclude that the equations of motion in the new coordinates uh, look like that. Uh, both q dot and p dot are all zeros. And uh, therefore, all we need to do in order to solve the system is to express q as a function of q, p, and t, and p as a function of q, p, and t. So the old ones in terms of the new ones and the time. And uh, what's really awesome is that q, p, uh, the new ones, uh, they could be the initial values of of the old coordinates, q and p. So uh, let's use our favorite vanilla transformations for this. Namely, f2 of old coordinates, new momenta and time, uh, or um, in the hamilton jacob approach, we will define it as a function capital S of old coordinates, uh, new momenta, and the time. So let us then design F2 such that the new Hamiltonian vanishes. So what that means is that H as a function of all the coordinates, old coordinates, and uh, the function of the new momenta Uh, and time, because there is nothing else to write, plus the partial time derivative of uh, the generating function uh, is equal to zero. So what's interesting here to note is that s is a function of qi's, that's because the new momenta are constants. So that means that we have first order partial differential equation for our unknown function s, right? We only have function s. And uh, we have um, n plus one independent variables, q1 through qn plus time. That means that we're going to have n plus 1 constants of integration uh, or the free parameters. Uh, so the solution will look like uh, will be a function of q1, uh, qn, and uh, of n plus 1. Uh, a variable free <laughs> n plus one constants of integration uh, plus uh, the time. But one of these constants of integration, this one, uh, will actually be not interesting because uh, it will be just a constant added uh, to uh, our function s because c, our h only depends on the derivatives of s. So you can add a constant to it, which is not interesting for us. 
So let us now uh, figure out the algorithm by which we're going to uh, solve the system. So let's uh, start. Uh, so let's start with the the first step. Uh, we're going to uh, set the new momenta to be equal to the constants of integration. These are new momenta. The next step is we're going to uh, compute the new coordinates. And once we invert this relation, uh, we're going to get the expression for Q as a function of alpha, beta, and time, where alpha and beta are, uh, are the new uh, momenta and coordinates. Uh, finally, uh, we're going to be able to compute the old momenta um, by taking the partial derivative of the generating function with respect to uh, the old coordinates. And the generating function uh, will depend on q's, alphas, and time. And from here, we're going to get that our momenta, pi, are equal to a function of alphas, betas, and time. So note here that, that alphas and betas are conjugate to each other. Uh, remember that alpha are the new momenta and beta are the new coordinates. Finally, all that's left for us uh, is uh, item number four. Uh, that is, we would need to relate the alphas and betas to the initial conditions with which the system starts at time equals zero. That's all there is to it. Let's try and uh, check out a few examples. Hello, and welcome to part two of lecture 21. One thing that I want to start out here before we get to the example is what is actually the physical meaning of our function s? And uh, one thing to note here is that ds dt, the full derivative, uh, is given by, that's because, as you remember, s is only a function of q's. Uh, the the big P's are constants. So that means uh, that because these are the old momenta, this all gives us, oops, because these are the old momenta, this gives us PI QI dot uh, plus uh, DSDT, which actually is negative of our Hamiltonian, because remember that Hamiltonian plus DSDT gives us zero, the new Hamiltonian. And that means that all of this is uh, simply our Lagrangian. And so from here we get that S is simply uh, the action. Uh, it's the generating function So let's now consider an example. Uh, a very simple oscillator. This is nothing but a particle in a well. So let's just write down the Hamilton Jacobi equations. And let us now try and use uh, uh, an approach uh, to separate uh, the variables the time and uh, the Q terms, the spatial and temporal terms. So these are the Q terms, and these are the time terms. Know that there is a really intriguing similarity between this equation and the Schrodinger equation, although it's not exact. So let's write the Schrodinger equation. So if we were to set psi to be equal to an amplitude uh, times is over h and uh, we would uh, 
uh, ignore the spatial and temporal dependence of A. Uh, then uh, when we plug this into the equation, uh, we would get the following. So uh, this actually uh, looks very much like the Schrodinger equation, uh, except that we actually dropped uh, the uh, second order term. Why we have to do this in order to get the Schrodinger equation? This is actually a very important question with papers being written about that. Uh, so we're going to leave it at that. Uh, you can uh, reach out to me if you have questions. I'm happy to point you to those works. So let's use the separation variable variables over here. And uh, we're going to write down that s is equal to sum of sq, which depends only on q, uh, plus uh, st, uh, which depends only on t. So that's how we work on separation of variables. And moreover, uh, we're going to call as q of q as w of q. So let's uh, put this thing in. And you can see that this is just a function of q and this is a function of t and because these are functions of different variables the only way we can maintain this relationship for all values of q and t is if uh, this is uh, a constant which we will denote as alpha and this is minus that so that when we add the two together we get a, an identical zero so from here we're going to be able to immediately uh, conclude uh, that st is going to be equal to minus alpha t because it's trivial to integrate this for alpha equal to constant. Um, and uh, here uh, it's interesting to note that alpha is the energy of the system. Um, and uh, all that's left for us is to integrate this part. So when we do that, we are going to get that dw dq, uh, this is equal to square root of 2m alpha minus v of q. This might look familiar to us because we've already done something very similar when we were separating the different degrees of freedom uh, in the central potential problem. And uh, as a result, from here, we can write out that uh, alpha, sorry, s is equal to minus alpha t, so it's s of t plus uh, s uh, of q, uh, integral of dq uh, times that. So what is left for us to do here? Uh, well, there are uh, three steps that we need to follow. First, we're going to set capital P equal to alpha. Uh, then step number two, uh, we're going to set beta equal to capital Q or D as the alpha. And uh, from here, we could immediately write out what beta is. That is minus T plus an integral over dq of square root of m divided by 2 of alpha minus uh, v of q. And from here, we can invert this to find what is the uh, expression for q. And uh, finally, uh, the third item is we can compute the little p's as the partial derivative of s with respect to q or more specifically, we can write it out as such. Uh, bingo, problem solved. Uh, this shows the power of hamilton jacobi approach, although I must admit that this is more of a, a simple problem uh, where you can 
uh, use this variable separation technique, although it tends to work uh, rather often. In the next part of the lecture, we're going to consider a specific form of this potential, a harmonic potential. Uh, so far, we kept it as a general expression. And I'm going to see you there. Hey, uh, welcome back. This is part three of lecture 21. We're coming back to our particle in a well. And this time, we're going to actually specify what the well looks like. So uh, let's uh, take, for instance, Uh, v of a form m over 2 times omega squared times q squared. So uh, this will be a particle in a harmonic potential. So in this case, uh, from 2 right over there, we can write out that beta is equal to minus time plus square root of m over 2 times the integral of dq over square root of alpha minus 1 half m omega squared q squared. And uh, we can integrate uh, this integral because this is a derivative of an arc sine function, the inverse sine. And so we can write out that this is equal to minus t plus 1 over omega times arc sine uh, of q omega square root of m divided by square root of 2 alpha. And uh, therefore, we can invert all of that. Uh, and uh, get that q is equal to, so we are getting the q out from here, uh, square root of 2m over alpha divided by omega multiplied by sine of omega t plus beta. Uh, and conversely, we can get what the momentum is, uh, what is it? It's 2m alpha minus m squared omega omega squared uh, q squared or if we simplify things uh, we are going to get that this is all equal to uh, square root of 2m alpha uh, times cosine of omega times t plus beta. So now let's, uh, so that was uh, item number three, and let's go to item number four, which is to relate to the initial conditions. And uh, here we uh, can write down that alpha is uh, the energy of the system. And uh, uh, omega beta is the initial phase. That does it for part three of lecture 21. We're going to start the new topic of infinitesimal canonical transformations. Exciting, huh? See you there.